So uh, Mason is an independent game developer. Um, his studio is called Anthropic Studios, and currently he's working on this game called Way of Rhea. I've gotten to see some, some demos, and it's, it's quite cool, as well as the tech that he's built uh, behind it in order to make it easier to develop uh, by himself. Um, he also gave a talk last year at Handmade Seattle that was really cool. I highly suggest you go watch it. Um, he essentially went through a process of quantizing the specific game market he was targeting uh, using uh, the you know, little bits of data that, that Steam gives you. Um, he's also a member of the uh, Zig Software Foundation board. Um, so he's, how many board members are there? Just the three? So he's yeah. one of the three that you might want to bribe if you want to <laughs> get the changes you want. Um, but uh, um, let's just keep it to games. Um, hey, put it for Mason. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for the intro. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Yep. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, these things are so much easier than holding the mic. Um, so, yeah, I guess intro's not needed anymore, but uh, I'm Mason Normali, an independent game developer, board member in the Zig Software Foundation, and I occasionally teach uh, grad and undergrad students to make both games and uh, game engines. Uh, how many people in the room were at Handmade Seattle? Okay, awesome. So most of you probably saw my last talk, uh, as you just mentioned. For those of you who didn't, um, it was, uh, it's not survivorship bias on successful software endeavors, uh, and it was kind of looking back on my current game, Way of Raya, and looking at what I learned from a business perspective uh, building that game. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you can check it out. This is sort of my technical counterpart to that. So I built a custom engine for that game, and this is me going through some of the, I mean, you, know, you learn a lot of things in any project, but some of the maybe most important things I learned, or maybe the most important thing I learned uh, in building that engine. Okay, so game engines. How many, uh, how many game developers do we have in the room? Okay, we got a lot of people. Uh, how many people do work on engines? A lot of people, okay. So most of you probably don't need an intro, but not everyone's a game developer. We're gonna talk a little bit about what I see a game engine as, and we're gonna build from there uh, to the lessons I learned. So what is a game engine? Um, we could try to define it as a collection of specific technologies, you know, renderer, physics engine, et cetera that games tend to use. Uh, this is close, but the problem is different, different games need different technologies and different uh, engines supply different technologies, so it's like, it's not, like it doesn't stop being a game engine because it doesn't have physics, right? So it's not quite right, it's getting close. Uh, we could define a game engine as the code that you carry from game to game. That's maybe a little bit better. Uh, you know, if you're writing game number one and then you go to write game number two and you realize, I don't need to rewrite my renderer, I already, I already have that. Uh, you copy paste it over, maybe same for physics, and maybe all that stuff you move over is your game engine. Uh, and that's close as well, but we have general purpose engines like Unity, Unreal, Godot, uh, mock engines in the room somewhere. I can't see you because of all the lights. Uh, I don't know where you're, oh, right there you are. Um, so, so we got these general purpose engines that might not even uh, be supporting a specific game. Um, so instead for now, let's just say a game engine is a game's runtime. Okay. So why make an engine, right? As I just mentioned, there's lots of general purpose engines out there. Uh, and it is often a good choice to use one of them. Uh, and here's the game I'm working on right now. Uh, it's a side-scrolling puzzle game about color changing. Uh, and I love it, I love this genre, but there's nothing in here that couldn't have been done in a general purpose engine. Sometimes you make a game like Teardown is a great example. You really need custom tech to support it. That, that isn't the case here. Uh, so, so why didn't I use Unity, Unreal, et cetera? Um, there's a lot of different reasons you might not. You know, maybe you want to own the code base. Uh, maybe you don't want to use something that's overkill for what you're working on. You know, Unity is going to duplicate every single one of your files to make a meta file to track them. And you know, you're like, ah, I, don't, I don't want all that. I just want something small that supports what I'm making. Uh, the main reason for me was uh, workflow concerns. Uh, I really like uh, this feature called hot swapping. Um, I, I think most of you probably heard of hot swapping. You know, the idea is you're working on a project and you can edit the code while it's running. Uh, so. In, in a game, this becomes really important. We're going to come back to this idea a lot in this talk that iteration time is really important to designing games. Uh, you don't know what's fun up front, and so you want to iterate fast. Say you're making an action game, and there's a final boss, and you're tweaking the AI to try to make it more fun. Uh, you don't want to get in a situation where you play the game to test it out, you get to the final boss, you fight off the minions, you start fighting the boss, and you realize, hey, AI is not quite right. Uh, quit the game edit the code, recompile the code, wait for the code to recompile, reload the game, wait for all the assets to get loaded by the GPU again, play from the save, fight off the minions, 
and AI is still not quite right, start over again. At some point, you just give up. You're just like, it's good enough, right? But if you have hot swapping, you can just edit it, pause, edit, pause. You, know, you, you just uh, alt-tab back and forth, and you, you end up getting a lot closer to that like, global minimum that you're looking for. So I wanted to be able to do this, uh, but none of the major engines at the time uh, supported it. And as far as I know, they don't really now either. Uh, someone inevitably on the internet is going to tell me Unity supports it. Unity supports it in theory, but in reality, this is what happens when you try to use that feature. Uh, and in case you think I'm, don't get me wrong, lots of smart people working at Unity, there's, there's reasons, you know, it's a big code base, it's complicated, but in case you think I'm giving them a hard time here, this is after a minute of recompiling, and I only added a comment to the script, so it actually shouldn't have had to done anything. Um, uh, on, the, on the flip side, here's uh, hot swapping in my engine, and, and again, I have an easier task than Unity. I have a small code base. I can see the whole thing. I, you know, but but the point is, is because I built something small myself, I was able to say, all right, I'm, I'm just going to prioritize this and make it work. So this is a silly example. I'm just editing some visuals, but it would work for anything. It works for the level editor. It works for the physics engine. Um, you edit the code, and in this case, the character doubles in size. Um, so. That's a lot of work, right? Like, even for making it, it it's, it's like how how uh, how am I as one person who you know I have a team, but I'm the only programmer and the only game designer on the team. So, how am I going to build a whole engine and also actually get a game done? Uh, and the answer is I had to adopt a kind of minimalist perspective, right? Uh, so, I can't remake Unity or remake Unreal as one person. That's that's way too much work. We're going to have to figure out a way to only build the things that we need. So there's kind of three core tenets to the kind of minimalism I adopted uh, in making this engine. Uh, one is that I'm treating the engine as a light abstraction over the underlying system. Uh, the further from the hardware you get, the more tough API choices you have to make, uh, the more performance problems you have, and the higher risk you have of misplaced effort. Right? If you are building the you know, higher level abstractions that may be powerful, uh, but you're building them early in the project, you don't necessarily know what you're going to need later on, and you could spend a lot of time on the wrong thing. Uh, so I just kind of give, you know, access to the capabilities of the hardware. So I started with, you know, like direct graphics APIs strung throughout the game, uh, no asset pipeline, uh, very minimal sound mixer, et cetera, stuff like that. Um, so just, just the minimum so I can get something on screen. Uh, next tenet is uh, performance by default. Uh, and so the idea here is that uh, when possible, uh, I'm going to just have tightly packed arrays of and algorithms, et cetera, right? We're going to try to do things in the simplest, fastest way we can, but we're not going to like uh, optimize until we actually find bottlenecks, right? So code's fast by default. It's not blazingly fast by default, but it's fast enough, and then when we find a bottleneck, we spend effort optimizing that. Uh, we're not going to build a fancy thread pool task system up front, right? We're just going to just going to kind of do the minimum to. It's a 2D game anyway, right? So just do the minimum to kind of make it work. Um, and you can get pretty far this way. Uh, hot swapping, for example, takes about 80 milliseconds. Um, despite I never, you know, I never optimized it. It's just that's just what it came out to. I think it's longer now because Windows changed something, and now every time a file changes, it triggers my file watcher twice. So actually, I guess hot swapping takes 100, and but it's fast enough that it doesn't matter. I don't. I'm, I'm not actually bothering to fix that. Um, and then the, the last uh, tenet is abstraction on an as-needed basis, because we do need abstractions, right? We need to get some stuff done. Um, but uh, I'm only going to need it when I, we're only going to do it when I need to. Uh, so for example, for the level editor, uh, it started out looking like this. Uh, no, I'm not the author of Sublime Text. Uh, the level editor was just an ASCII art format. So this is day one of development. We still had you know, prototype art. I got the gamma correction wrong, so you can hardly see the image. Um, but you know, it took about 10 minutes to write the ASCII art format, and that let me prototype the game idea more quickly than if I tried to build the editor up front. Uh, a few weeks in, that didn't quite cut it, so I built a grid-based level editor, so I could kind of, it was, it was too hard to reason about the puzzle design while looking at the ASCII art. So I made something more visual. I could drag and drop items. Uh, onto the uh, grid, uh, and that worked for a while. Um, over time, I added more and more features, and three years later, this is what it looks like. Um, so it's a more modern, fully featured editor. It has hierarchies, you know, parenting and stuff. It has lots of different options. It's 3D, you can actually rotate the camera. Even though the game's 2D, it lets me do parallax. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff going on here, but it's, every single thing is something I needed, right? Because I only added it when I needed it. Um, and yeah, this is, this is what I end up with. Uh, so, so I think that this, this kind of like approach to software, this minimalist approach to software, I think is really popular among systems people, low-level people, a lot of people who come to conferences like this. And having spent the last 
three or four years working on a big project this way. I mean, it's a small game engine, but it's a big project, right? Uh, I wanted to give this talk to tell you that I think this is absolutely the wrong approach to build a game engine. <laughs> now, you didn't think I was going to preach to the choir for 45 minutes, did you? <laughs> so, so I want to be clear, I still write most of my software using that approach. I, I don't think minimalism is, is bad. Um, I think there is a class of software it doesn't work for, and in this talk I want to make the case uh, I want to make the case that there is a class of software it doesn't work for, and I want to kind of drill down into why that is and maybe how we can look at software through a more general lens that helps us figure out what approach is correct for the software that we are currently writing. Uh, to do that, I think we kind of need to start with figuring out why minimalism is so attractive to us, right? I mean, I outlined some reasons I wanted to get stuff done, but that's kind of the reason for any approach is you want to get stuff done. Um, so, so why do we, especially as like systems programmers, as, as low-level programmers, why do, we, uh, why do we really like minimalism? Um, I'm going to say that it has to, there may be reasons I haven't thought of, but I'm going to make the argument that it has to do with the typical programmer bottlenecks at various experience levels. So not like performance bottlenecks, but bottlenecks towards like getting stuff done as a programmer. So as like a newbie programmer, right, you're having trouble with things like syntax, tooling, and like algorithmic thinking, right? You're, you're forgetting your semicolons and your code just won't compile. Uh, that's very frustrating, right? Because you, you kind of know what you want to do and you don't know how to tell the computer to do it. Um, and you might get past the point where you're using Microsoft Word as your code editor, and you might learn where to put the semicolons. But uh, <laughs> yeah, fun fact, I, used, I was on Mac OS. I used text edit as my code editor for, for years as, like a, as a kid. And uh, I used to think that errors on high line numbers were like so much worse than errors on low line numbers. You want to put your sketchy stuff near the top because you don't want to have to count down 495 lines to the... <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you've got to use good tools. But, but at some point, right... Uh, it might have taken me a few years, but at some point you progress out of newbie stage uh, and, uh, and, and you become a beginner. Uh, and, and you get used to the algorithmic thinking too, right? You get to the point where you might not be able to design like crazy algorithms that do really hard stuff, but you can, for the kind of things you're trying to work on, that's not the problem anymore. You know, you, you become kind of more of a beginner and, and if, if you need to make the computer do something, you can do it. The problem is tech debt. You, you, every, it's, it's, this is similarly very frustrating. You get into this situation where you're writing a project and you know you know how to do it, but it's maybe a few weeks, a few months into the project, it all just turns into a giant ball of spaghetti and you, and you don't know why. Uh, and every time you start over and you're like, next project, I'll just, I'll just do better. But you can't really like ask Stack Overflow, why is my large project a ball of spaghetti, right? Like, I mean, you can, I think there might even be stack exchanges for that, but it's, you don't even have the language, you don't know the term ball of spaghetti at this point. Or you, you, don't know what to, you don't know what to look up. And so you just keep trying to write software and inevitably you keep running into this wall where it just kind of blows up. And it's, not, it's frustrating because it's not that you don't know how to write the algorithm or that you don't know how to use the language. It's just that it kind of falls apart somehow. Uh, and at some point you get fed up enough with this and that you start discovering like, hey, you know, people have written about this, people have opinions on this, and you start to become an intermediate programmer. You start realizing, okay, like, maybe I shouldn't name all of my variables X. You know, like, maybe if I don't do that, then a few weeks from now, I will remember how my stuff works. And you know, maybe people weren't crazy when they were telling me I should indent my code properly, because you know, it actually does make it easier to read. Um, you start getting into design patterns, you start getting into testing, you start getting in, you know, you might get into OOP, you might get into all these various things that, 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 that you're, you know, attempting to solve this problem of everything becomes unmaintainable. Uh, and this is great, like, you, you're making a lot of progress, but the, the, the dangerous thing about this stage is that you don't get anything done because you're overcorrecting for the possibility of tech debt. And I think we all go through this, and I think most of us spend years in this stage because it's not frustrating. You think, you, I'm, do, I'm doing good things. I'm writing my tests, I'm commenting my code, it's all clean, it's following the solid principles, I'm refactoring to constantly make it perfect, and I'm never finishing it, right? Like, like, this, this, like I, th I think most of us have spent years in this stage, and you're not frustrated because you, you feel like you're doing good things. Uh, eventually, though, you start to realize, you know, I haven't finished anything for the last three years. I should probably change my approach a little bit, and you start to become more advanced. And often, at this point, the way you make that uh, course correction is through minimalism. You're, you're like, okay, well, yeah, I shouldn't name all my variables X, but maybe I should just use an auto formatter instead of worrying about and having opinions on things like spaces versus tabs. Like, it doesn't matter. Just run the auto formatter. It's fine. And you know, maybe. Uh, it's good to have tests, but maybe I don't need to worry so much about all the OOP stuff. You know, you start to kind of dial back and do the minimal thing that lets you get your job done. And that's great. Uh, but what is the bottleneck of the advanced programmer? Well, 
I'm not sure, and there's probably multiple, but I want to make the case that maybe sometimes we overcorrect for the possibility of being an intermediate programmer. Maybe sometimes we're afraid to plan for the future because we were burned by planning for the future as intermediate programmers. And yes, the future is often hard to predict, but maybe sometimes it's not, and maybe we should take advantage of that. I think sometimes as advanced programmers, we forget to think about who we're making the software for. Right, uh, Loris was talking about you know, training your strong arm versus training your weak arm. I think the way you get to be advanced at something is you keep training the strong arm. So you get to that point where you've been training your strong arm, now you're an advanced programmer, and you've been focusing all on programming and not at all on people. Uh, and that's not going to lead to good software, right? Because the software is made for people. OK, so I, I want to tell the story of a gameplay feature in Way of Raya. Uh, and it's going to be an example of where minimalism maybe didn't serve me well. Uh, but it's not the only example. It isn't, this isn't the killer thing that makes minimalism bad. It's just I had to pick something, and I, I want to kind of I want to give specifics. Um, uh, and then we'll, we'll kind of generalize from there. So it's late in the development, and I'm having a, a game design issue. And um, it, it's, not like a, it's not a bug, it's, it's an issue with the design of the game, it's an issue with the player experience. And I'm contemplating different ways to solve this problem. And one of the solutions I'm considering is adding speed controls to the game. So how many people have played like Sims or, or uh, what's that, Oxygen Not Included, games like that, right? There's often like a, you know, a control where you can say the game should pause, play, go fast forward, stuff like that. I, I was thinking like, oh, I'll just add something like that. Uh, that might help, but I'm not sure, right? It's, it's really hard to know, the work of a good game designer is like, the, having the humility to know that you don't know what's good until you actually test it, at least on yourself, if not on other people. Um, and so I start thinking about like how hard is it going to be to test this? So, so what are we going to have to do? Well, we're going to have to touch a lot of code. Um, I didn't systematize very much when building the game. I was like avoiding abstracting unless necessary. Uh, and that, I mean, that's fine, right? Like that was part of what we said we were going to do with minimalism was we're going to say not, don't do too much of that. And then when we need to, we do it. And hey, maybe now's the time we need to do it. But, but the reality is that, yes, implementing this feature will involve touching a lot of code. Um, fast forward sounds simple, but once you put it in the context of a game, not everything should be fast forward. The menu shouldn't be fast forwarded. Not everything should be paused. The background wind animation shouldn't be paused. Uh, there's lots of little itty bitty kind of complications here that you don't expect. And we're going to have to touch a lot of stuff. Uh, and also, in the simplest implementation, fast forwarding at 8x speed, for example, which is what I was considering, uh, is going to take eight times as long. Uh, now, we could do a smarter implementation, uh, and then we're going to have to touch even more of the code base. Um, so can we evaluate the future first? This is clearly going to be a lot of work. Uh, so instead of pouring a lot of time into implementing this feature and then finding out it doesn't actually solve the problem or it causes new problems that I don't want to deal with, can we maybe find a way to check if the feature is good before we spend a lot of time building it? Um, well, the problem is, is games are experiences, and again, we, we don't know what's fun a priori. Uh, we need to experience them. I mean, we can try to think really hard about it and guess, but uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't typically work out too well. Um, we could just kind of half implement speed controls, but unfortunately, like, it's a gameplay system. There are some bits and pieces we could leave off, but the, the, I don't want to get too much into the weeds of the game itself, but I'm trying to solve a problem where the experience is frustrating. If my partially implemented speed controls are frustrating, then I don't know. I'm not going to be able to tease apart why I'm really frustrated. Again, it's easy to think, I'm going to know. I'll know it's because of that and not because of that. You don't. You, you, you need to implement it well enough uh, before you can really test. Um, uh, and also, we can't afford the simple approach from a performance perspective. Uh, yes, it's a, it's a 2D side-scrolling game. Yes, it could be very fast. But you have to understand that with a game, performance is currency. right? So if you're rendering 60 hertz, then you got about 16 milliseconds to render your frame, or to, to render an update, you know, to do everything. Uh, so what that, what, what's important to understand, though, is that if you come in faster than that, it doesn't actually give the player a better experience. If you're, if you're making a game, you're targeting 60 hertz, you got 16.66 milliseconds, or a little less because of the compositor. If you, if you render the game, if you do everything in two milliseconds, so you might think, I'm doing great. My game's going really fast. Well, the player still is only going to see 60 hertz. So really what you've done is you have denied the player all the cool stuff that you could have done in the remaining 14 milliseconds. <laughs> you don't want to deny the player cool stuff, do you? <laughs> so, so realistically, uh, if your game's fast, you'll just put more cool, more cool stuff in it, which is great. Uh, but it means that, uh, you know, we have, it's late in development. I've spent the available headroom on cool stuff for the player. Now, you could be conservative about this, and actually I was. Uh, I actually was rendering it about four milliseconds, but on my machine at least. But, but this is asking for 8x headroom. That's a really big ask. Uh, it doesn't, if I'm rendering in four milliseconds, I still can't 
take eight times as long. That's, 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 that's crazy, can't do that. Um, okay, so, so this, is, this is a lot of work, right? Like we, we wanna evaluate if the feature's good, but we're gonna have to do a bunch of work to implement it, and it's gonna be really slow, which is again going to be frustrating and prevent us from, from evaluating it. Uh, we could optimize, again, that would be even more time consuming. We're spending all this time optimizing to check a feature that we might not even want. Uh, and, oh, almost forgot, on top of that, some of, I think we like to think of abstractions as being slow, and I, I think this is kind of narrow-minded. Um, abstractions, sure, an abstraction is, is, if you're looking, if you're zooming in on that piece of code, an abstraction is either as fast or slower than what you would have written by hand. But when you start to zoom out on a big project, you start realizing like, well, you don't have time to hand optimize everything. So in this case, rendering isn't the bottleneck, but it's a simpler example. Consider uh, Way of Raya with uh, OpenGL calls strewn throughout the code base. If you decide you want to optimize your renderer, you might want to try things like sorting your draw calls or combining everything into one shader or separating out into more shaders. If you don't have abstractions, you can't do that, right? You're gonna have to spend I don't know, a week going through to every single drawable object in the game and manually rewriting it just to test if that optimization would work. Um, whereas if you had, had abstractions in place, then you just tweak a few lines of code in the abstraction, see what happens, and sure, technically you could have gone faster than the abstraction, but in reality, you're going to go faster with it in, in some of these cases. Because I erred on the side of not abstracting whenever possible, uh, optimizing is a, it, it doable, you can definitely do it, but it's going to be time consuming and we don't know if we even want this feature. So what do we do? We either skip the feature or we take the risk and put in the work. Um, I really wanted the feature, so I put in the work. Uh, it's not perfect, it runs at 4x speed instead of 8x speed. And I concluded the feature's great, and so I probably will put in more work to optimize further, maybe I can up the speed. Um, that's fine, it's a happy ending to the story, the game has fast forward. Uh, but what you have to understand is that game design is a sum of thousands of these decisions. Like, like, this is what you do as a game designer. You're like, should we support undo redo? Which action should have undo state? Should the enemy be able to pick up objects? Should we have, uh, what happens if you're falling when you push an undo state? You know, should teleporter show the image? There's just like a million different little things and like half of them get thrown out, right? You have all these ideas and you try them out and half of them aren't good. Uh, and so that means that if you have more friction in your design process, you have less time to try out ideas, which is rather unfortunate because trying more ideas results in making better games. Okay, so we kind of have an impedance mismatch here, right? Like, I'm saying that uh, the engine should probably support me in trying out lots of ideas. And, and I kind of started from here, right? I was talking about hot swapping and how that was important to me and that's why I'm making an engine. Uh, but then we got all focused on this like minimalism, minimal game runtime kind of thing. And when you're looking at a game engine as a minimal game runtime, there's not really any room to consider things like the workflow for the designer the designer isn't even mentioned in the uh, definition. So maybe we should reconsider this definition. It's not like technically incorrect, I guess, um, but maybe instead we should say a game engine is a tool used by game designers to design games. Right? Now we can reason about the person who is using our software and think about them when we make trade-offs. Right? So a game engine, I'm gonna argue, is an art tool. A uh, game engine is to game designers what Photoshop is to people who work with images. And we will get into non-game engines, I promise. Like, um, game engines are an example of the argument I want to make, uh, but we're gonna get into the weeds a little bit more first. Um, if we consider game engines to be an art tool, maybe we have some new trade-offs available that we didn't have available when we looked at them as a game runtime. Minimalism was very well suited to avoiding misplacing effort on the unknown. That's why you adopt minimalism, right? You're like, I don't know what the future holds. It's hard to predict the future. I don't wanna spend a lot of effort on something. At the beginning of the project is when you know the least about it. Let's so wait until later, then we can kind of do what we need to do. And the game runtime lens presents us with a lot of unknowns. So when we're looking at things this way, it makes a lot of sense. Does the art tool lens present a lot of unknowns? I would say no. I would say that uh, game engines as an art tool are very predictable. You might not know what your game is going to do, but you certainly know what your game designer needs to do, right? For example, uh, your game designer needs to import a lot of assets. So yeah, when I complained about Unity's asset system, that was bait. Uh, that's good, you want that. 
Uh, I didn't build it in Way of Raya initially, and then I spent hours manually converting assets to the in-engine format, and eventually concluded, yep, I need an asset system, so I built it. Uh, and that's fine, right? That's minimalism at work. You wait until you see you need it. But the thing is, I don't get those hours back, right? The time that I spent converting assets manually, they could have just been converted automatically. Uh, and sure, if I didn't know whether this is going to happen or not, it makes, but of course it was going to happen. It's a video game. It has assets. <laughs> like, well, like I, I'm not being smart by saying, well, you know, you never know. Maybe I can get away without the, of course I need the asset system. I'm not going to get away without that. Build, just build it from the beginning. Save yourself the trouble. Um, so, so as a result, you know, time spent, you know, for example, time spent optimizing isn't premature, right? Performance is currency. You're going to use any available headroom to do cool stuff for the player. So build the fancy thread pull task system. I mean, you're a systems programmer. You know you want to. Or <laughs> it's, your, it's literally your job. You don't got to feel guilty doing it. I mean, listen to King. You know, maybe, maybe don't build the thread pull yourself. Th thank you for that advice, King. I was going to build the thread pull myself. I won't now. I'll use STD thread pull or something. But, but, uh, <laughs> but like... You don't gotta feel guilty doing your job. This is literally why you're building game engines, right? Because someone needs you to do this and you want to do it, so, so do it. I mean, unless you don't, in which case, I don't know, don't build game engines anymore. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we can uh, acknowledge complexity with appropriate abstractions, right? Like, we, we know where the complexity is going to be. We don't know everything. Uh, again, I still use minimalism in lots of places, like gameplay code. I don't know what the game's gonna be. I'm not gonna try to guess that up front. I mean, I, I know the genre, but you know, who knows how the details are gonna turn out. But uh, we know where the complexity is gonna end up in the engine, and we can build systems to support that stuff. So, you know, yes, you need an input system. Uh, I got this right with Wave Raya, thankfully. But, but like, yeah, you don't wanna just be writing out if key down everywhere in the code base. You're gonna have a bad time. And you're gonna have a bad time and it's gonna be hard to feel bad for you because we, you knew, you knew it's a game and it has input, right? Like, it's not, it's not crazy to, to plan for that. Um, and, and lastly, you know, you, you can accept that you need good systems to optimize at scale. It's a game, it's gonna be, it's gonna be big even if it's a small game. You, you need to abstract stuff or you're never gonna be able to try out like, you know, experiments with performance. My point is, is that we're not falling into the trap of the intermediate programmer by planning for known futures. Okay, I want to do the uh, internet's favorite case study here. <laughs> How many people are familiar with the ECS pattern? Okay, so this is most of us. I'll, I'll make this part quick. Um, so what is an entity component system in ECS? Uh, games have a lot of objects, aka entities, uh, things like NPCs, players, trees, cars, mailboxes, I don't know, whatever it is. Um, we need to store these objects somehow, right? Uh, lots of different ways to do it. ECS is one way to do it. It's bougie structive arrays. <laughs> So, so, so an entity is broken down into components, and you store the components off somewhere else in some cache-efficient uh, layout, uh, and then you can kind of run queries where you're like, okay, I, I want to know, I want to get a, an iterator over all of the entities that have an animator and a mesh, so I can uh, update them, but I, I don't care about all the other components. I, I, I'm not a database person. I'm told this is basically a relational database. I, I don't know. Someone else can later tell me if, that, if that's correct or not. Um, so any, anyway, I, I, I think that you guys all get the idea. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a way to organize your game objects. So why do people do this? There's lots of different ways you could organize a bunch of objects. Why, and this is at least my, I'm not a AAA person, but my understanding is this is industry standard at this point. So, I mean, and everyone raised their hand, everyone's heard of it, so it's at the very least super common. So, so why does everyone love this pattern so much? Um, if you search on the internet, uh, you're gonna find two main answers. Uh, and they're gonna be from an engine runtime perspective. Uh, one is that they want to avoid deep hierarchies, right? Uh, I, how many people have been burned by deep hierarchies? Yeah, so, yeah, don't want to do that. Um, so you could use ECS and not do that. Uh, also, they're very cache efficient. Uh, how many people love cache efficiency, right? This is just like, uh, there's no point in even asking, right? It's, it's, it's fun, right? Let's do that. Um, but if you, if you start thinking about it, neither of these really hold up. Like, I don't know if you noticed, but it's 2023. Nobody's writing deep hierarchies anymore. This, this is a false dilemma, right? Like, I, I, don't get me wrong. Like, if, I, I don't know for sure, but I think it was like, it was like Cowboy Programming blog post. I think it was one of the Tony Hawk games. You know, they were talking about like, yeah, we were using deep hierarchies and we transitioned away from this to ECS and it made our lives better. And I 100% believe that. But, but today, uh, no one's writing deep hierarchies. You're not choosing between ECS and a deep hierarchy. So that's not the reason to use ECS. Also, Cache efficiency? Why are you iterating over all your game objects? You could just not do that, and then you won't, like, Way of Raya might be a little bit of an outlier, but it has about four live objects on a given frame. So I just put the live objects in an array and I iterate over those. I don't, I don't care if the object, array of four objects is cache efficient. Um, so everyone's using it, though. Clearly, they're getting some value out of it. Uh, so, so, so what's going on? 
right? Through this lens, through, through the game runtime runs, this pattern is ill-defined, over-complex, and unnecessary, and that's what I concluded when I started Way of Rhea. So I didn't adopt it. Uh, I, just, I just made a list of tagged unions, basically. Um, I figured list of tagged unions, that's super simple. I don't have to write this complex allocator, basically. I just, just make a list. Um, and that seemed like a really solid decision at the time. Uh, but if we look at ECS through the art tool perspective, it becomes immediately clear why everyone uses it. Everyone uses it because it's good for designers. Uh, shout out to your friend Juliet for helping me see that for the first time. Uh, designers can mix and match components and get meaningful results. You can run queries on the world and say, hey, I want all the objects that satisfy them. And yeah, you don't need to iterate over all the objects, but it's sure pretty cool if you can. Uh, and it makes it a lot easier to design nice gameplay systems. So yeah, I mean, I, I think it's pretty clear this is why everyone actually uses ECS. Um, and, and, and yes, it has all the cache efficiency, and yes, it's not a deep hierarchy. Like, like the, the cache efficiency comes second, right? You adopt the pattern for the designer, and then you go, oh, it's kind of the workhorse of the game. We better optimize it. That's, that's a result, not a, not a cause. Um, so, so here's a little hobby project I'm working on with Andrew. Um, I didn't want to give you this talk today without having like, tested out my ideas. I think it'd be kind of unfair for me to say, this is how you should build a game engine not having done it. Um, so it's not a finished engine, but I'm building an engine in Zig. I guess that's, that's an announcement, but not really. It's just, just for me. You should look at Mock Engine if you want something, uh, something kind of general purpose uh, for your own projects. Um, but I did build like a fully featured archetype-based ECS uh, for this, and it's great. I freaking love making gameplay with this thing. What you're seeing here is actually a bug. That's not supposed to happen. You see that, that like, Tron-like trail that it's drawing? and then the asteroid bounces off the trail. It's not supposed to bounce off the trail. <laughs> I, I, I just accidentally added the uh, collider component to the uh, trail object. And then I was like, hey, this is really fun, so I left it on there. <laughs> uh, and it's not the first time either, but yeah. So with, with my like, array of uh, tagged unions, I could have implemented that feature, but I wouldn't have. It would have been a bunch of, I would have never even tried it, and it would have been a bunch of, boiler, it would have been a bunch of boilerplate. Uh, whereas here, I'm like accidentally making good gameplay. Like, who doesn't want to accidentally make good gameplay? <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I love working with this system. Uh, so the minimalist perspective misled me, right? Uh, I ignored a well-tested and powerful pattern that everyone around me was telling me was great uh, because I was looking at game engines the wrong way, and I confidently concluded that I was right. So yeah, I mean, the art tool lens would have served me really well here. It would have made it clear to me that the complexity is being spent correctly on the designer. Uh, and again, yes, it, it's complex from a performance standpoint too. You're doing all these complicated optimizations, but I mean, same thing happens for like, I don't know, spatial hierarchies, right? Like if you put something in a game and it becomes something that everything in the game goes through, of course people are gonna spend a lot of effort coming up with crazy ways to optimize it, and of course you should take advantage of those. Okay, so. We're not all working on game engines, though apparently a lot of us are. That's kind of cool. Um, how, can, how, can, how can we apply this to, to software in general? Um, I, I, I want to propose a lens that we can look at software development through uh, that would have saved me from this error but isn't just hyper fixated on game engines. Um, the, I, I think that as programmers, we, uh, it, it's, it's not, it's not we're, we're building technology, but it's not about the technology, right? We're building software for people. So I think as programmers, we serve the users, or at least we should, right? I think we should be thinking about the people we're building software for. And I think as well as maybe overcorrecting for being, you know, what we experienced as intermediate programmers, I think we also just forget to think about who we're building stuff for. Uh, so I think that when you're, building a software system, you should ask yourself, who is the user? Right? That should be an easy question. And with game engines, uh, the user isn't the player. Right? The player doesn't play the game engine. They play the, the, they're the user of the game, uh, but not of the game engine. Uh, and it's not the game. The game's not a person. They can't be the user. So the user is clearly the game designer. Right? And once you realize that, the whole, the whole art tool perspective kind of just automatically falls out of that. But with a different project, you might have come to a different conclusion. Right? So you ask, who is the user? And then you ask, what are their goals? Right? What is the game designer, for example, trying to do? They're trying to build a good game. right? They're trying to iterate on stuff fast. Uh, they, you, can, you, know, you can enumerate more specific goals a game designer might have. You can watch the game designer use other game engines and see what kinds of things they do, or ask yourself what you do. Um, so you want to know what their goals are. And then you want to ask how you can support their goals. Right? And you want to make sure that the software you build for that user is supporting that user's goals. And I think if you do that, 
I think if you ask yourself these questions and answer them correctly, and then when you're making trade-offs while working on your software, you don't focus on the technology, and you don't focus on kind of like looking inward at the code, but you focus on how can I use the technology to support the people using it, then maybe you will be able to build software that you can love. All right, any uh, questions for Mason? Got one uh, behind you. Oh, thank you. Uh, I got some links, by the way. That's the slide. So I, I know I have all these without URLs, but you can get the slides and then click on them. I figured that'd be easier. Uh, thank you for the talk, Mason. I well, obviously agree with everything that you said that I experienced myself directly. Um, what do you think of the uh, new Apple VR headset? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, I don't have any inside knowledge or anything. I'll tell you what my gut reaction is. I think that Apple is betting that in the future, this stuff will be very important and everyone will use it. I think they know it's not now. Because um, how, how many of us are actually going to drop, what was it, $3,000 or something for, for the thing that it can't, it can't do like a lot of, it can't do much that I like can't do elsewhere right now. I think they know that. Uh, and so I think they are trying to find a way to justify in the short term being in the space so that in the long term, when it maybe takes off more and is like, and is like a part of everyone's world, but they're one of the dominant players, that's, that's what I think is going on there. Uh, thank you, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I was mostly asking because, um, and feel free to correct me if you think I'm wrong, but I, I played uh, with the, uh, I, I, I have friends who have like a, an Oculus, a Vive, and I tried those headsets a couple of, I had sets a couple of times, and um, the experience that I had is that the thing was like a nightmare to use until you got into the game, and then it was fun. Um, and I was surprised, uh, I found it interesting that Apple seemed to be the only company to really uh, think about the end user being somebody who is not just a VR game enthusiast. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I, th I think that's a good point. And I actually hadn't thought about it that way, but that applies well to what I've been talking about. Um, I mean, Apple's very good at that. And uh, I do agree, like, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm not a VR person, and whenever I attempt to interact with it, it is a bit of a nightmare for me, because I, I don't know all the things, and I don't know exactly how to set it up. Um, and uh, yeah, Apple might kind of pave the road there a little bit by focusing more on the users. And they are doing some smart things, I mean, in terms of saying, okay, like, we know there's not gonna be like big AAA games coming out for this thing right away, and it wouldn't be able to run them anyway, so let's just make all the iOS apps work, right? I believe they're doing that. So, and that, that is thinking about the users and what do the users want out of this? They wanna be able to do something, and there's a lot of software already out there. Yeah. Uh, one last thing that I'm gonna um, give back to the microphone. Um, Another interesting point that I totally agree with you, but from the opposite perspective, meaning, uh, feels weird to say, but from the artist, pers designer perspective maybe, um, was that I'm now in a weird situation where um, I do a lot of like slides and content of this kind, and I feel like I outgrew like slide programs, like. Uh, Google Slides, PowerPoint, these kind of programs. And I feel like I could, I, am, I have the ability and the time and the, the, the willingness to uh, take it a step further and like have animations that I could design, but those tools don't support it anymore. And at the same time, other tools are like way too complicated. Like, like I, not a game dev, I wouldn't be able to make a slideshow, like a presentation that under the scene is like a a game, a full-fledged game. And so um, I was searching for tools that uh, matched my skill level right now, and I feel like this is super important. Um, and there's probably a lot of uh, unexplored opportunities out there. Yeah, I think there probably are. I mean, I, I definitely felt the, the pain of like wanting to do cool things, like when, just when, whenever I make a slideshow, but not wanting to I didn't want to go all the way up to like using After Effects or something and exporting a whole movie or, or animating it on Blender. I don't, I don't know what other people use. So it would be cool to have some in-betweens there and maybe game technology could do that. Um, we should talk later. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Ben, you had a question, right? All right, cool. While I'm walking across the, the theater, what are the names of, of your cats? <laughs> Those are uh, my partner's cats, Mac and Miri. Mac's the cow cat. Miri's the standard issue cat. <laughs> um, 
Are there other domains where you feel like programmers are too minimal, like minimal to a fault to the detriment of the users? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, like I kind of live in the game world, and so I might not, I might miss you know obvious things elsewhere. Uh, but I, I guess I would say that like for me, the minimalism is like a uh, it was just a jumping off point to to get to like we often find other things to do besides thinking about the users. Um, so I'm sure there are. I'm also sure there's other you know, industries where maybe it's not minimalism that's the problem, but there's just something else that everyone's fixated on when they should be fixated on the people they're building software for. Sure. All right, thank you. Sorry, that's not a, not a super exciting answer, but. A quick follow-up to that, actually. Uh, huge fan of the talk, actually, and that it's not survived by us. Also a huge fan of that one. Uh, so thank you for the things you give to the audience. So uh, when you say that entity component systems, okay, it makes sense because of what it's serving, in this case, the designer, and it's a well-known pattern. And because we're overcorrecting for not, you know, this whole thing you just said, okay. But isn't it also a skill or an art to know which patterns and which things that already exist are there are worth pursuing, if that makes sense. Like, how did you know into the component systems? I guess you had a trusted friend who told you about it being useful, but then if you're like in the landscape of things that should just be adopting and uh, versus not adopting, that is a skill in itself, isn't it? And if it is, like, how do you how do you build up that skill? That's a really good question. Yeah, first you got to build a game engine for four years using the minimalist approach, and then no. Um. <laughs> So, so uh, I think that, uh, yeah, that is a really good question. And, and I think this is why things tend to happen in order in terms of like programmer like skill kind of progression. That's why, I mean, I don't think it's super controversial that we all go through those phases. So I don't think you can, for example, tell someone who's a beginner programmer or an intermediate programmer to adopt this perspective and have it, like they kind of have to go all the way through the, the chain. Um, mm -hmm. So I, that being said, some things I would consider. So like ECS, like it is, like it does seem super standard and everyone loves it, so at the very least I should have taken it more seriously. Um, I also should have considered how costly is it for me to try it out. Uh, it only took me like 40 hours to implement it, so it's like, if everyone loves it and I think it's obviously terrible, then maybe it's worth spending the 40 hours to figure out where this disconnect is because everyone could be wrong, but like, I should at least figure out what I even think they're wrong about before just concluding, well, I don't know, they're just wrong, who knows why. Uh, so, but now this is, the, this, is, this is maybe easier, right, because ECS is so well loved. Uh, and I, everyone's heard of it because the people who don't like it also like hate it. So like you just, I think, I think all that controversy comes from the fact that the people who like it don't necessarily know why they like it. And then so they say, oh, you should adopt the pattern. And then someone's like, why? And then they give bad reasons and they go, well, why are you telling me to adopt a pattern without good reasons? Anyway, that's kind of the easy case because you know, as a game designer, you know, you, you've heard of it, or game developer, you've heard of it. Um, and it's definitely iffier when you get into stuff that uh, is less well known because maybe it turns out it's, some people really love it, but it's only really good for their use case or something. Uh, and I think that the more uncertainty you have, the more minimalist you actually should be. Uh, and I do use minimalism within these systems, right? So for example, uh, in the ECS, uh, it was very important that I find a way to parent objects to other objects. Uh, and, and I know roughly how other people do it, but I didn't have as strong opinions about there being like a really great way to do it. Uh, so I did a very minimal thing uh, that I intend to kind of see how it works before I build off of it. And there's a bunch of other places in, like, like prefabs, for example. Everyone does prefabs different, and I don't think prefabs are a solved problem. So uh, for those of you who don't know, prefabs are a way of saying, like, I have like a preset object and I want to like spawn it into the world pre-configured. Um, anyway, detail doesn't matter, but the, but the point is, like, I don't think that's a solved problem. So I did take a more, I, I know I need to do it, but I took a more minimalist approach because I don't want to spend a, three months building a crazy awesome prefab system and then find out that's not really how prefab systems get used in the games I'm working on and I wasted my time. So you're basically tastefully ping-ponging back and forth between yeah. minimalism and adopting something that exists. That makes sense, thank you and so much. And trying to listen to people who've been there before too. It looks like you've been working on uh, Way of Rhea for a while, and based on your talk, um, you sounds like you've had a, a lot of um, opportunities for change in perspective and changing your pretty fundamental approach to building it, which I assume means a lot of opportunities to rewrite a ton of code, um, um, the engine code. Do you, do you feel like you're at a point where you, you can 
focus more on the content than the underlying engine code, or enough to just do the art part of it? Yeah, so, so the, the game is, I can't announce the release date yet, but it's, it's, like, it's very close to being done. Um, and so I'm at definitely at the point in a game's lifetime where when I want to add features like fast forward, I'm like, you know, I am just going to hack some stuff in there. Because uh, it's, it's, uh, I need to maintain it in terms of I need it to keep running on people's computers as operating systems upgrade, but I don't plan to, like I plan to ship it soon. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm trying to spend as little time working on the engine as possible uh, at this point in time. And especially now that part of what led me you know, it has been a long time in development, uh, and part of what led me to have all these realizations as of now is thinking about game two and thinking about, can I reuse this engine for game two? Because if you're going to make an engine yourself, uh, you're already taking on a huge cost, you would like to be able to reuse it. And I thought long and hard about it and decided I don't want to reuse this engine for game two, um, which is what led to a lot of these ideas. That also means I don't want to put a lot more work into the engine. I just want to make sure the game is good because the engine's not going to support a future game. Yeah, cool. Uh, do you think in the long term that Unity and Unreal are going to take more of the like space of game engines, or do you think there's going to be sort of like a resurgence of people writing their own game engines? Because um, one thing I notice is that you see an Unreal game or you see a Unity game, and they usually look fairly similar. You can spot an Unreal and a, a Unity game. They, they can be very different and interesting, and if you know how to write your own shaders, you can make it a lot different, but that's just something I know. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the future is hard to predict, um, so I, I'm not sure. Um, I'm, um, I'm glad that these engines exist because it means that a lot more people can make games because uh, previously you had to be someone who wanted to write game engines to write, and I might be that person, but not everyone is, and there's a lot of great games I've played by people who aren't people who want to write engines. Um, so I'm glad that things like Unity and Unreal exist because we get more games by more people. Um, but also, yeah, I mean, there's lots of things I don't like about them, and there's reasons I'm not uh, using them. Uh, and partly I just like writing engines, but uh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, we definitely see a lot of people, in, the, like, in, in my local connection to like my, my little subset of the indie scene, I see a lot of people adopting Godot, which is cool. Um, I don't know, though, if my local kind of connections are representative of a larger trend or not. Uh, and you asked about making engines. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sensing any, any upward trend in people making their own engines, but that'd be cool. I mean, I'd like to see some, I'd like to see some new ideas in this space. Any more questions? All right, let's have a, a 10 minute break. And then we'll have uh, Dominic's uh, talk. Yeah. Okay, so Mason, uh, thank you, great talk. Uh, also, like last time, I really enjoyed it. Usually I ask one silly question to the speaker. In your case, say whatever you want. Whatever I want? Oh, I used up my chance. Thank you. <laughs>